Um, I'd like to introduce Amy Kremen now. She's the Associate Director of the Irrigation Innovation Consortium. Um, and the Irrigation Innovation Consortium works with diverse partners to support irrigators in testing and implementing resource conservation oriented tools and strategies. IIC also supports collaborative research focused on advancing knowledge, technologies, and applications to support adaptation and resilience in agriculturally dependent water limited regions. She has worked in a variety of capacities over more than two decades in areas related to food and agriculture as a cook, farmer, researcher, writer, magazine editor, I should have this up, and farm and policy consultant in both the United States and Canada. So please help me welcome Amy to the podium. Thank you so much, Amy. Okay, awesome. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm gonna can carry on the story. So building on Matt and now Dwayne. So you've got farmers who aren't sure if there's anything that they could really do, but then you have a farmer who's like, yeah, but actually there's stuff that we can do and I just needed a push and there was something that I found that worked for me. Okay, so you can imagine that there's a wide use of soil types, systems, ages of producers, different kinds of water management constraints in a spatially diverse region across the Ogallala region, but there's something that anybody can do. And the question is, open ET could be used in a variety of ways for both decision support and also validation of when implementation of technologies or crop shifting and other things could make a difference. So let's talk about what that could look like. Um, I'm here on behalf of the IIC, which as Robin just mentioned, we've been involved, we've been in the business since, since 2018 of putting together public-private teams across the West to focus on advancing irrigation systems, hardware, software, tools, algorithms, and it more and, and increasing years, in, in recent years, um, looking at synthesizing data related to effective management strategies. So once you have these advanced technologies, what difference do they make anyway for people's bottom lines, for an aquifer, um, for people's capitalization um, and, and planning. Um, this work was supported for um, six years for, by the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research, and now we're turning into a new chapter with uh, the, the NRCS as a major sponsor with Inflation Reduction Act, or, um, Inflation Reduction Act dollars. That's um, going to be kind of, it's, it's underpinning the programmatic aspect of the work I'm going to talk about today, which is related to scaling change involving communities of practice around producers. Um, the two programs that the NRCS is helping us support, they've been on the ground level at, uh, in sort of this organic growing process that's been happening since the survey that Matt did around that time in um, 2018. There's been this expansion, this organic expansion of, of examples of replicated practice and adaptation of two programs, the Testing Ag Performance Solutions Program and Master Irrigator. These programs have different approaches but common goals that they, where they uh, basically create, it's a one-to-many approach that kind of crowdsources expertise from the technology sector, from the commodity groups, from the academic side, and even groups like farm credit, so people who are involved in the business of crop insurance, and basically helping people know the pros, cons, and costs of any kinds of management decisions they might make, they might make around water, not just in terms of what they irrigate with, but how to manage precipitation. So things like residue management, what difference does having trash in the field actually make for snow capture, that kind of thing, and how do you actually put this together in a system of practice and a planned practice to take steps going forward. Um, one, of the un one of the benefits of a one-to-many approach like this is that you can actually kind of facilitate greater awareness of this ever-evolving <laughs> local, regional, and national shifting set of incentives that are becoming available, whether through a Climate Smart program or through a local conservation or a state conservation board. You know, there's constantly shifting availability of funds and paperwork associated with those funds, and space you can create a network, a social network that helps people navigate that paperwork, even find out that those opportunities are available, and even access things like discounts on technologies like these soil moisture probes. So basically you get somebody through a program and off the back end they get a 10% discount, and they've actually met the people who are uh, providing those tools and actually make a social, a personal relationship with people that isn't in a sales environment. It's more about how do these tools actually work, and why should I do them, and what's the ROI? Um, the way Master Irrigator works, it's a 32-hour course, and so where the pros, cons, and costs are covered, everything must be proven, commercially available, and the teachers are a wide range of folks. So we get producers talking about their experience, so people who have deep water and people who are shallow water both talking about their experience with implementing soil probes. Where did they put them? Why did they put them there? What kind of difference did it make? How many fewer revolutions did they actually do of their center pivot systems? What money did that save? How did that inf affect their productivity in wet years and dry years? Right? You get actual producers talking about their experience. You have the academic community showing up and providing um, 
complementary, um, the, the science that complements that practice-based data. And then you can have the technology produce providers also in the room, not, again, not selling their tools, but selling the, the, the how and the why of their, you know, of, of their tools as well. These are small classes designed to facilitate um, people's courage to speak up. And what happens is people walk in, and a lot of them, this is their first professional development experience of this kind. Um, and we're really covering everything from how to, from hydrology to soils to agronomics to high tech tools to lower tech tools, putting it all together, accessing incentives. It's like this smorgasbord of, of material. Things like when was the last time you had a system audit? Is your system actually optimized? Like the aquifer is in a different place now than it was. What's the difference in that efficiency for your pump trying to get that water from a much bigger depth? How much money might you be saving if you actually switch out and get a more efficient pump? When was the last time you got an audit? Do you know how to get an audit and how to get that paid for? These are the kinds of things that we're able to kind of put all together in the classroom. And it's pretty amazing. People show up and they're kind of shy and they're kind of like they don't want to talk. But the way the class is designed is to pr promote a lot of exchange, a lot of back and forth, a lot of role modeling of people talking about their experiences. And then what it's like, it's like a cork comes, pops right open. That altruism, that goal, that fear for the fact that their kids may not be able to live there in the future, it just comes like rushing out, that concern that people have, the excitement they have had over things that have been successes and hearing from the person who's sitting right next to them, that interactivity is just as important as what people are presenting. And that whole experience leads to people going through a four-day course, setting plans, and then we follow them for three years to see how they've actually implemented those plans. So the cool thing about this and the reason why the magic of it or the special, the secret sauce of Master Irrigator, it's non-prescriptive, highly interactive, totally locally adapted. So there's like 100 level kind of courses that you could pick up and put anywhere because they're the same. Things about soil water holding capacity, for example, you know, uh, heavy soils and light soils. You could teach this anywhere, but then there's sort of specific local adaptive things like in the eastern part of Colorado, we don't talk about soil health, we talk about residue management. In the San Luis Valley, they're all about soil health. So some of it's messaging, some of it's the same content but packaged slightly differently to correspond to local needs and interests. Um, and one of the key things, it's not just the taking of the class or the people that show up for the class, it's the constant adaptation every year to kind of update what are the new tips, tricks, topics that need to be added to refine this program further and involving producers in actually designing the class as being part of, they're the invested problem solvers. They're the ones who know what needs to be taught and we also figure out how to line up the best charismatic and credible teachers to do so. This is just a quick glance of the kind of things that we cover. Like I mentioned before, we start from the ground up or from the, from the aquifer up. So what about hydrology and policy related to the, the hydrologic management of the aquifer? What about residues and soils? Moving on to irrigation scheduling, new opportunities with telemetry to get all this information on your phone in real time. Looking at different things about application uniformity and system optimization. There are so many different opportunities. And then talking about grazing covers, using imagery. Um, different kinds of incentives that are in place for moving forward and retirement as part of a comprehensive holistic farm-wide strategy for water management. These are the kinds of things we cover. So looking across the region, that left column is sort of these different dates of this organic expansion of master irrigator across the high plains. And we have at the top, that's Texas. So that one, and I've got the coordination, so it's really interesting. These programs are being coordinated by different entities. We've got a groundwater district, one set up as a nonprofit that's going statewide. Then we've got a university-led program. And there's new programs that are currently in development with this NRCS support in Kansas and Nebraska. And I've just put some highlights, which are actually kind of, if you look at the data from across these master irrigator programs, I've just pulled out little things, little notes from the different programs to date that are relevant actually for all of the programs. So. When people show up to these classes, you know, sometimes you get people in these classes who have an agronomy degree. Some of them have never taken a soil science class in their life. These producers wear so many different hats, right? So everybody gets something. In some cases, it's a refresher of what they already knew. It sets them on a path for motivation. They, they hear one tip or trick, like one guy who is a very advanced conservation-oriented producer that participated in Colorado Master Irrigator. I talked with him like on the third day when we were talking about system optimization of those pumps. And he said, you know, I knew a lot of this stuff. I've, I'm doing a lot of these things, but then today I just learned about this program where I could switch out my pumps. That's gonna save me probably about $30,000 just this season by swapping out my pumps and not wasting energy and getting better application uniformity on my fields, right? And these are the kinds of things that like OpenET could actually kind of test. Like, has a system been audited in the last decade? Hmm, no. When a system has been audited and those, those, those um, updates or upgrades to a pump or to nozzles have been put in place, 
do you get better application uniformity and what is the, how can you track that from the sky? I think these are the kinds of things you could look at, at you know, using in, um, and sort of getting optimization across the aquifer. Um, so there's different kinds of things. We've got this rapid expansion in Colorado. People are super interested. We've got all these different use cases. So we've got the Republican River Basin, which is uh, a lot of uh, commodity crop specific things. Then we've got Four Corners that's just gone into place where that has more surface irrigated systems. And then in uh, the Mesa Delta region, we're actually looking at doing a dual, a dual class where we're looking at perennial tree crops as well as the commodity crop sort of aspects. So we're starting to like get into a lot of uh, experience in adapting this program for a lot of different applications. Um, at this point, even though it's just 25 people per class, there is this huge coffee shop and effect where people are walking into the co-op or whatever and they say, you know, this year I yield not, I didn't just yield 200 bushels, I yielded 200 bushels using only nine inches of water. This is the kind of uh, conversation that we want to have. It's, um, and, and it's really having huge policy impacts. Like, just in the state of Colorado, we're looking across the border to Kansas, where they have different policy structures for flexibility, like the Lima that, that Dwayne described. So basically, the Lima that he described, it's 55 acre inches over five years. But that means in a in a really dry year, if you need to use more than 11 inches, you can. Basically, the, the flexible policy structure is giving people the ability to use more water in years that they need, but less water in years that they don't. And we don't have that in other states. So people in Colorado, we're listening, we're bringing people from Kansas to teach at Colorado Master Irrigator, and now that's stimulated major discussions across the groundwater districts about how can we get these policy structures within our own state? Or how can we actually educate people on what use it or lose it actually really means? Because people think that if they don't use their water, they're gonna lose their water right when that isn't actually what the law means. So we can actually use this class to kind of debunk these myths about what the policy actually, how the policies actually work. These are, and these are major social things that need to be done. The communities of practice around this program are massive, spanning you know, local to federal and uh, industry uh, groups in between. Um, there is a major investment from NRCS in all of this, whereby master irrigator graduates get a 20% bump when they apply for EQIP for um, approved conservation practices and tools. This has happened at all the master irrigator programs across the, um, can I get a time check just really quick? Because we're, I know we're five minutes. Okay, great. So then I'm going to move on to this other program, which is complementary. The Testing Ag Performance Solutions Program is this risk-free sort of testing approach to looking at um, how do we reward and recognize effective management of nitrogen and water. And the way this works is opposed to, like, you know, everybody loves a competition, but farm management competitions farm to farm are really difficult to know. It's apples and oranges, different soil types, different rainfall. It's really hard to know what good management looks like. So this basically crowdsources management. We've got basically different plots laid out on a field where we've got people growing the same crop but different varieties and we're looking at how people are most effective and not just growing a crop but marketing it. Throughout the growing season, they have these decisions that they get to make. We collect tons of data on the field so that people are basically driving their farm by remote control, and then the universities, we actually implement those decisions in the field, giving them as much data as we can, a whole variety of different kinds of technology and imagery and information about the soil so that they can make their decisions. And you get this wide range of people participating, a wide range of technology companies participating. They're excited to have their tools demonstrated. And you get people who have never used soil moisture probes and people who are pros. And everybody's sort of gaming to see who can be, who can be the best manager. Um, they actually have to market their crop in, in a simulation. So this is sort of an example. The season starts in April, ends in November. And they're actually having opportunities to market their crop every single day um, while they are managing their nitrogen and irrigation. The, they get the distinction of winning for being the most profitable based on a farm budget that looks at costs and expenses um, for every, everything. Like everything is the same except for the things that they can influence, like how much nitrogen they use, how much irrigation did they use. Um, there is a report there that you can look at. And this is kind of interesting. So this is a very simply plotted graph, but this is an example from the CSU TAPS program this year. Um, you can see you've got on the left, you've got um, the y-axis is irrigation in inches applied and the, the black line is yield. And see so what you can see really quickly is there's people, the difference between people who produce to, to use, the, use the most water and use the least water in the competition, the difference was 10 inches, which is pretty remarkable because we didn't start irrigating until June this year because it was super wet. And so you can look there at farm 11 and farm 5. Farm 11 used the most water, and farm 5 used several inches less, and they basically have the same yield. So this thing that Duane is talking about, about, or the Lima that he described, 
There's huge opportunities to use way less water with more dynamic management, with people paying attention. That has not been realized. It has not been expanded more broadly. And the cool thing about TAPS is like this is the way people behave in the field. Everybody's doing something slightly different, and we can learn why and how and how it makes a difference for yield. And I feel like Open ET has got to, you know, we can, use, we can, there's like lots of ramifications and applications. We can get into it in, in sort of the Q&A later, I suppose, when we talk about some of the applications that where I see Open ET being able to be used. This is the nitrogen graph from this year. Again, the black line is yield. And you can see that the control where we actually, after this, after the pre-plant, we didn't apply any more nitrogen. Nitrogen didn't make such a big difference. From the lowest to the highest yield, water was way more important than the nitrogen. And you can see that in this graph here. On the left, we have the, um, the yield for the irrigation applied. And on the right, you have the yield for the nitrogen applied. And there's no relationship, really. And so the, there's another takeaway here, which is that we are over-applying nitrogen radically. And all of, our nitrogen all of our nitrogen recommendations need to be updated. And so the TAPS program actually provides us an opportunity to sort of look, look at ways to dial in nitrogen. And so what does this all mean is that there's a whole lot of understanding that we need to do when you think about not just the management but then the marketing layer on top of it. When people actually take an effort at marketing, they do way better in this competition. And that's why you get the people all the way around on the left. This is basically different farms that competed in 2017. And you can see there's this even split. And on the right, you have people who applied nine inches of water. And on the left, you have people who applied nine inches of water. And one was way more profitable, and the other one was not profitable, right? This is actually what's happening in the field. And what we want to do is get people bumped over to the profitable side that also rep rep represents irrigation efficiency. And why is this important when you sort of zoom out? You can see the groundwater use in terms of the emissions produced just from groundwater pumping there on the left side of the graph. We've got the tons of CO2 equivalent um, and the amount of which that is coming from groundwater. And you can actually see the Ogallala outline right there. Um, as we move towards tracking these things and dialing in on what effective management is, we want to pay farmers for the stewardship. And there's actually a huge benefit or a huge opportunity to in tracking the reductions, also be able to reward stewardship for emissions avoided, not just in terms of irrigation not pumped, but in terms of nitrogen not applied. And that's what we can also study in the TAPS program. We're actually going to be able to be, and we have already, this is data from the Oklahoma TAPS program, where we can actually start to quantify what's the pre-field versus the in-field um, ramifications of better management of nitrogen on nitrous oxide emissions. So we'll be doing that work through the expansion of the TAPS program, which is now going to be, it's sort of in these various, so you've got master irrigator, and we've got TAPS. After master irrigator, we teach the things that we've learned from the management of TAPS in master irrigator. So these two things go together. So just to sum up some thoughts about shift, so what does this mean for crop shifting? I think I've run out of time because we're really running short. But thinking about the what all of this means now. So we're, we've got all these programs. We're starting to scale these one-to-many approaches. We've got all these groups, local, regional, and federal, public and private, involved in this conversation, showing up at these programs. What does it mean? Um, it means that we can start to actually really talk about everybody's role in the various kinds of reductions that need to be made, whether we've got the sort of sustainable use with these deeper pockets, where you've got this sort of extended use scenario where there's a lot that can be done with amounts of management that are in that 20 to 40 percent range that are absolutely doable as long as we scale the kinds of combinations of agronomic and technological practices. And then critically, and this is something I'm really interested in, is that there are areas where the water has or will be going away. And we're not actually thinking about how to apply the limited water that remains to get land back into pasture and other things to avoid blowing sand and to prepare the communities for alternate economies that will actually um, uh, that, that, are, that are critically important, as Matt pointed out in the beginning of this, of, of this talk. So I will stop there. Lots to say. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Amy. I think those two programs are just um, really impressive. I need to grab my bio so I get some things correct. Um, one of the things that I, I'm really excited about, and, and Amy sort of touched on it, is that you know, like we've always said that OpenET is for the user community. And there's been a lot of really organic uptake and use. Um, and not just organic, right? Thanks to folks like Jonathan and others who's, who've helped us spread stories, tell stories, post them online. Thanks to folks like Dwayne who talk about OpenET and other venues. Um, use is starting to spread, but it's really going to take more concerted and proactive efforts at sort of building communities of practice and getting these stories out amongst producers and growers on the ground. 
for something like OpenET and all these other tools that Amy is speaking to to really have the impact we want them to have. And so it's really great for me to see that folks like Amy are aware of OpenET and are thinking about ways of integrating it into programs like TAPS and Master Irrigators. I'm really excited to see you know, where that goes and the impact that that has in terms of some of these water conservation goals in places like the Ogallala and, and elsewhere. The other thing that Duane sort of teased um, at the outset of, of his talk, or maybe towards the end of his talk, and that I think Amy sort of touched on in speaking at the different levels at which, um, or scales at which folks need to be engaged in this problem, um, is that you know crop insurance and federal policy and things like that also play a big role in, what, in sort of the art of the possible for the decisions that growers and producers are able to make on the ground and, and the, the sort of ways that they are incentivized to make certain choices. Um, 